And I did not realize that a lot of grades hadn't been published, for which I apologize. And by the way, assignment 4A has incorrect grades because it decided that, due to my error, that the maximum grade you could earn was a 10 rather than 100. So lots of people made 10s and 9s on that one. You know, I'm, I'll go back in and I'll correct those grades. So if you notice that you made a 9 out of, you know, what you thought would be 100 or 10, that wasn't the intention. Okay. Object creation, a detailed analysis. If you've taken a C course where you had to allocate memory, you kind of have this idea. But when you declare something of a reference type, you haven't really allocated any memory for it. It's not until you hit the new keyword that the object is created. And that object is created in a separate area of memory called the heap. You can have several references going to the same object if you wanted to. We can make a car called car1, car2, and then after we created the car object, we could do car2 is equal to car. Now they're both pointing to the same area in memory. They're both pointing to the same object, like having two street signs pointing to the same street, having two different maps that show the same way. So any changes to car, like car.year is equal to 2014, then if you printed car2.year, it would also print 2014. So space is allocated for the reference variable, but, you know, that's just essentially a pointer. The memory for the object itself that was allocated with the new keyword will eventually be freed when there are no more references pointing towards it. And that's, done, that's handled by the uh, garbage collector. So the program keeps track, and when all the variables that are pointing to that object have fallen out of scope and been released, then the object will eventually be released too. So here's our car. That's the reference variable. And here's the object that it's pointing to, which you could call the heap. So this has got address 1062 hidden inside it. This creates the reference variable, sticks it out on the what's known as the stack, although it's not using these words. Car is equal to new car, allocates the object, puts that out on a heap, and then copies the address of that back into the reference variable. And then anytime you want to change any of the members of it, you know, it kind of follows automatically. I want to change car.year, okay, well, car is at this address, it comes over here and it finds that member.year and changes it. Assigning a reference. If you have both references pointed to the same object, if the object is updated by one reference, the other reference variable notices that change. It's the, they're pointing to the same object. You paint the door red on your house, you have two signs going towards it, it's still only one door. That can be disconcerting. Suppose you want to create two car objects that are the same except for their color. You better not do this. Create John's car, make it a Toyota Silver 2014, and then make Stacy's car and just set it equal to John's car and hope that it copies all those values over. It doesn't. They're both pointing to the same car. It's, just, it's the same car with two stickers on it, John and Stacy. So then if you paint the car peach, well, now John's got a peach car too. You know, just pointing to the same thing, pointing to the same place in memory. So John car and Stacy car pointing to the same object out on the heap. You change the color from silver to peach, the next time you print John Carr dot color, it's also going to print peach. So what do you have to do? You have to allocate two objects. You have to use the new keyword twice. You can't just copy using an equal sign. If you want to make a copy of a reference variable, you should not assign a reference to another reference. Instead, you have to instantiate a new object, and then you have to copy the values one at a time. And in C++, there's a concept of over overloading your operators, including the assignment operator. You can make a program in C++ that when you set one reference equals to the other, it actually copies all the members over into the new one. Can't really do that with, uh, with Java. Pardon me? Seven. Chapter seven from unit one. We need to move it to Unit 2, but it's still in Unit 1. So if you're going to 
copy the values. So, say we have our little infamous point class. Class point. I'm not actually typing code in. You don't have to create launch net beans to do this, but I may as well get it loading in the background, eh? And it has three parts, X, Y, and Z. So out in my client class, out in main, whatever, we all know that that's not the syntax for main. So I'm going to just call it client. I'm even going to spell it right. Cool. Okay. So if I do point P1, and then P1.X is equal to 3, P1.Y is equal to 4, P1.Z is equal to 0. And now I want to make a separate point that contains copies of these values. Here's what I have to do. Well, firstly, I didn't even allocate a new object, so that would blow up right away. Right now, P1 is set to null, so when I hit P1.X, it would generate an error and stop running. So P1 is equal to new point. If I was smart, I would have written a constructor that would allow me to set all three variables. Remember my rules of thumb for creating classes is one, data private, members public. I didn't do that this time. Two, getters and setters. I didn't do that either. Three, constructor, if it helps to set the data easily. I didn't do that either. I'm being a really lousy programmer. Four, I don't remember what four is. Oh, yeah. Give yourself a toString method. Five, add a dot equals method so that you can compare two objects. And six, add a copy method of some sort. And I'm sure there's a specific name I should give that, but I am going to do these three things. I'm just skipping the first part because I want this class to be as simple as possible. Okay, so now I have a point named P1. I'm going to make another point, and I want it to be an exact duplicate of P1, not point to the same object. So I am going to make a new one. Point P2 is equal to new point. But then I have to say P1, P2.x is equal to P1.x. P2.y is equal to P1.y. P2.z is equal to P1.z. So it's like transferring all the bags of groceries from, you know, your, your one Toyota to the next one. You have to copy each one individually. Let's write a method that will do that instead. And like I said, I've forgotten the name that I wanted to apply to this. But it could be something as simple as void copy. You need to pass in a reference to another point object. I'm going to call it other. And you'll see why, because I'm going to use the this keyword, and it'll make it real easy to show what's going on. This.x is equal to other.x. This.y is equal to other.y. This.z is equal to other.z. Now if I want to make a copy, it's far easier. Point P3 is equal to new point. And then P3.copy. Pass P1 in as your reference. That's easier than doing that, especially if it's a really complex type. The other thing you could do is you could take a constructor that accepted a point and copy all the values that way. That might look pretty neat, you know. If I was going to do that, which I'm not going to, creating a copy of, of the point would be as easy as doing this. Sorry, I'll scroll it back up in a minute. P4 is equal to new point you know, P1, like that. Make me a copy of P1, copy all the values into P4. We could do that real easily just by making a constructor that looked like this. Okay, so according to my little rules, I did put a copy method on here. That's a good thing. Yay. Two string methods are always good because then you could print out the contents of the object even if it's just for debug purposes. Because right now, if I print it out P1, I really should stick this in a NetBeans, eh? Then it would just print the address. I shouldn't do that. That probably is loud in the recording. Okay. How 
And by the way, if you're copying code and you can't get the package to work, just delete the package statement. That's totally fine. Okay, so here we go. Oh, and I have a comment. Well, hopefully I'll remember it. Let me just put a comment up here. Talk about hard-coded values. All right. Okay, here's my point. No pun intended. There's my point class. Now I'm going to take this client code and I'm going to put it inside a main. So I'm going to cut all that, delete that, scroll down to main. We have some note, notes here, so I'm going to put a comment block around that. Okay, so in main, here's my client code for using it. This is how you copy an object if you do not have a copy method. If you do not have a copy method, instantiate, and then copy each member. Which is a real pain, right? If, it's, uh, if they're private, you know? If I was having to use getters and setters for all three of those, the code would look really nasty. It would look something like this. I'm going to type this and I'm going to erase it. P1.setX P... Oh, sorry, I'm at the wrong place. This is actually supposed to go here when we're going to make P2, which is supposed to be a copy of it. If we didn't have... If we had getters and setters and not direct access, it would look like this. P2.setX p1.getx and then we would repeat that three times for x, y, and z. Does that look fun? I don't know if that looks fun to me. I wouldn't want to have to type that, especially if you had a class with 20 members or 30 members. That'd be really annoying. It's far better to make a copy method. So, that's bad. I'm going to delete it. So we added a copy method that accepts a reference to a point object and then does the duplication of each member in there. And just a parenthetical comment, we could make a constructor that did that as well. Since we have a copy method, making a constructor that did it might be trivial. But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna take the time to go do that. Okay, so out of the rules of things to do, I did one of them. Another would be to add a toString method. I'll scroll back down to the client if you need more time to copy it. Public string toString. And all it has to do is return some kind of representation of the data that is more meaningful than what is printed by default, which is just the address of the object and the name of it. So I'm going to make it return string.format and the three values x colon percent d, y colon percent d, and the format of string.format is the same as printf, z colon percent d. And so I'll, then I'll pass in this dot x, this dot y, this dot z. Pardon me? That's bad. Where'd that come from? That's six, shift six, not shift five. Okay, percent D, percent D, percent D. That way printing out an object is easy. Notice that it's asking me, it's giving me a little warning saying, you could add override notation. Well, sure enough, I could because every object already has a two string method, but that's just a comment. It's a weird looking comment to help the Java doc program if you ever start using a Java doc documentation system. You don't have to have that there, so I'm gonna undo that. What does the percent D mean? Well, you know, there's the print and then there's the print line. Uh -huh. There's also print F. 
So you could do this, system.out.println, and I want to print out p1.z is equal to, and then, you know, plus p1.z. That would print out the value of, of p1.z, right? Yeah. But you can also do printf, which stands for formatted print. And when you do printf, you fill in little placeholders. And then you pass in parameters that are going to fill in that placeholder. It's a placeholder, and the D stands for decimal. You, you feel like thinking that D is going to stand for double, but it doesn't. If I was going to rewrite this language from scratch, I would make that percent I for ints, percent Ds for doubles. But D stands for decimal. It stands for integer, and percent F stands for float or double. And the reason you want to do stuff like that is you can do some more complex formatting like this. You could say system.out.printf daily temperature is percent two dot or percent six dot two f and then print out the temperature 98.6 and it would format it it would say okay this is going to fill exactly six spaces and it's going to have a decimal point followed by two spaces Excuse me, two digits. So if this had more than two digits of accuracy, it would get rounded to only show two digits of decimal places. If it didn't have any, like we were printing out 98, it would add the two places. So what would get printed out would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It would fill up six places. There'd be a decimal point in there. There'd be two places after the decimal because that's what that specifies. And then there would be 1, 2, 3 before because after we've used the decimal and the two two places of precision, there were three spaces left. And so, the F is for floating point number. And F is for floating point. If you try to do this little nonsense about point two to display some fractional components, and if you do that with an I, it'll just give you an error. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that's two strings. So down here, I could print out our objects. System.out.println, I'm going to print P1. Then I'm, since P3 is a duplicate of P1, I'm going to print out P3. And I'm going to add a little bit of expository text. I'm going to say P1 equals plus P1. And then P3 equals, because otherwise we won't know what those are. We'll see their data, but we won't know the name of them. So what Java does is inside of a print line, it's assuming that everything in here is a string being concatenated to each other. Even if you just print a pure number, it gets converted to a string. How does it get converted to a string? Well, if it is a string, nothing happens. But if it's not a string, then the object's toString method gets invoked. If it's an integer or a double, it's a good question as to how that happens because those aren't classes, and so they don't have a two-string method. But anyways, since P1 is an object, it has a two-string method, and in fact, it's one that we overwrote, over, we have overridden with our own method. So this will invoke the two-string method as surely as if we had done this. This part is optional. You don't have to do that. So I'm leaving that there to show that this is the same. Ew, kablooey. You know what happened? I tried to send an, an integer data to a floating point placeholder, and it yelled at me. Let's try it again. All right. Oh, and, and uh, one annoyance about printf is it doesn't go to the next line, so you have to sli stick slash in on there to get it to do that. Alrighty, so we printed out two objects. It says P1 is equal to, and then the two string method generated this X colon, Y colon, Z colon stuff. And if we scroll back up, we'll see why. Because our point class 
as a two-string method that formats the data in the form of x colon, y colon, z colon. And the syntax for using string.format is exactly the duplicate of using printf. You create placeholders and then you pass in arguments that are going to fill in those placeholders. The C sharp language has a really odd way of handling placeholders. You can do some weird tricks with them. But this isn't C sharp. Pardon me? Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. We're almost done with that point object, but I'll let me do the point, the uh, the next method to the point object, if you don't mind, before I print it out. Now nah, I'm going to go ahead and print it. Let's do that. Okay. All we're going to add now is an equals method, and why do we have an equals method so that we can compare two objects to see if they're the same? What if I did not have a two equals method? How would I check to see if P1 and P3 are the same? What would my choice be? I can't just do this. If P1 is equal to P3, the only re the only thing that that would tell me, and I'm not even giving you a chance to talk, yes? And so uh, the way you would do it is uh, P1 dot... X is equal to equal. Yeah, exactly. You have to compare every member. And that's kind of a drag because if you later go on, go into the point class and you add 20 more members to it, then you would have to go and find your code where you were checking their members. So I'm going to show the, the tedious, laborious way, but I'm going to add a comment here as to why this is bad. And we've already been told that you can't compare strings this way, and it's the same reason. This won't work. All it does is see if the two references point to the same memory address. So we could do this if p1.x is equal to p2.x and p1.y is equal to p2.y and p1.z, let's put that on a line by itself is equal to p2.z, then we could print e the equal. p1 and p3 are equal. Now I'm just going to copy that print line and tack on an else so I can say that p1 and p3 are not equal. Okay, that's not too bad if you're only dealing with a few members. But then the syntax gets more convoluted if we made those members private and you have to use accessors, you have to use getters, and if you have a lot more of them. So ideally, you want to be able to do it this easily. You want to be able to do if p1 dot equals p3. Now that's actually compiling because every object has an dot equals method that you then have to override if you want to do something useful with it. But I'm curious as to what it's going to do without me doing that. Tell you what, I'm going to take out these braces, try to minimize screen space. Okay. 
This is the primitive junkie way. Instead, this is using dot equals, but we haven't overridden dot equals, so I wonder how intelligent it is. I'm going to run it and find out what it does. Yeah, it says P1 and P3 are not equal, and dot equals P1 and P3 are not equal. Now, there has to be some mistake in the code here because P1 and P3 look the same to me. 3, 4, and 0. So why did this code not work? Do you see something stupid that I did? P1 .x, yeah. yeah, yeah, thanks. It's P1.z is equal to P2.z. Okay. So now when I run it, it works. It says that they are equal. However, the dot equals method does not work because until it is overridden, all it does is the same thing as the equal equal sign. It checks to see if they're both pointing to the same memory address. So we're going to go back up and add a dot equals method, a Boolean method, to our point class that does this. It compares the three objects, the uh, the three, the three members. Then if we change that object, we would just change the dot equals method, and the code would continue to work. All right, are we all good if, for anybody who is typing along? Do you have this to your satisfaction? I'll print it out again for you, Benjamin. What we're going to go up here to do is add on a two equals method. So public, it's Boolean because all it has to do is return true or false, equals, and just like copy, it takes a reference to another point. And now we're just going to find out how equal they are. Yep, yep, very good. So I'm going to steal those three lines, and I'm going to say if this dot x is equal to other dot x, and this dot y is equal to other dot y and this dot z is equal equal to other dot z then return true else return false Let me make sure that that works before I, I get too proud of this technical monstrosity we have created. Okay, so both of them worked. testing. Let's go down here and change a member of P3. So above the if P1 dot equals P3, let's say P3 dot X is equal to negative 100. I should actually do it before I print it out, but anyways. It worked. Okay, I'm going to undo that change. So of the six recommendations, we fulfilled the last three. 
I could let net beans fill in the getters and the setters with the refactor menu. I think I'll do that just to demonstrate and then not actually do it. Looks like somebody texting, please, PLZ. Yeah, kind of a drag. I'm trying to make this stuff where you can actually read it. Okay. All right. This is just for giggles. If I want to refactor this so that I get getters and setters for these three variables, what I do is I highlight X, Y, and Z inside a class point, and under the refactor menu, I do re refactor, introduce, excuse me, not introduce, refactor, encapsulate fields, and then go for it. Click refactor. Now check out what it did to my class. It changed X, Y, and Z to be private. It added getters and setters for each one of them. Somewhere, right? Yeah, there's get X, there's get Y, there's get Z. It added a whole bunch of Java doc comments. And then down inside my code down here, anywhere where I was accessing X, it changed them to set X, set Y, and set Z, or get X, get Y, and get Z. So that's pretty neat to be able to do lickety-split like that. Sir? Yes, sir. If this, if this is false, it stops checking. Okay. And and or have short circuiting features is what they call it. And short circuits, meaning it skips code, short circuits sound so violent, if whenever it detects a false condition. So if this dot x is not equal to other dot x, it doesn't need to check the rest of them, so it blows them off. But if we were using ors, then if the first one's true, you know that the whole expression is true and it doesn't check the rest of them. And usually that's not a big deal, but if one of these was a function call, a, a method call for some reason, and you were expecting it to be run every single time this uh, expression was checked, it would actually be conditionally run if it was not the first one, you know, because it, via short circuiting, it might get skipped. And so that can cause weird little bugs if you are throwing method calls inside your conditional statements. And what I would do in that case is if your if statement is looking so nasty that you're making function calls inside of it, method calls inside of it, just make those method calls before and store the value as a Boolean variable, and then check it. That way you know that everything was executed. All right, I undid that encapsulation because I thought it made my code look ugly for the point which we are making. And I don't think in any of my assignments I've counted anybody off for not adding getters and setters, and I won't unless the assignment specifically asks you to do it. And I think the, uh, the UML assignment did. Okay, talk about hard-coded values. If you're going to use an array, you know, don't add this. This is just a sample. Int i array is equal to new int, and I decide I want to make it 10 items long so that I can do data entry into it. Then I decide I'm going to write a for loop that's going to allow me to enter that data, so I go come down here and I put for int i is equal to 0, i is less than 10, i++, plus plus. and then later on I decide I'm going to print it out, and so, you know, I scroll down some further amount of time and I do for, you know, x is equal to 0. You probably see where I'm going with this. x is less than 10, x++, plus plus, and then I print that item out. You know, print i array sub x. And the other one would have been scanning, you know, in to i array. So i array sub i is equal to scanner.nextint. 
something like that. The code is perfectly functional, but it is more difficult to maintain. The reason it's more difficult to maintain is you may decide later to allow it to be more than 10 items long or less than 10 items long. Say we get a request to make our uh, program support 20 values. I have to search and replace through the entire chunk of code, finding every reference to 10 and change it to 20. The better thing to do, one thing you can do is to declare that as some kind of constant, you know. Final int max array size is equal to 10. And everywhere you used 10, instead use max array size. That's better than doing what we just did. But better still, and you can do this unlike in the C++ language where you can't ask an array for its length. You just ask the array for its length inside your loops. For i is equal to 0, i is less than the length of the array. Do that for every for loop, every while loop. Anytime you calculate the average by dividing by 10 or whatever. And so, you know, down here, x is 0, x is less than ia dot length. So on, I think it was the map assignment. No, it was on the bitmap copy, you know, or when you're comparing the number of bits set in both of them. Um, a lot of people had 10 hard-coded into it. And that's okay, it worked. But in my testings, just to see how, how well the code was to maintain, I would change that 10 to a 4 and then recompile and run it. And if it blew up, then I knew that it had not been implemented like this. The other thing that I tested is everybody had a, you know, enter Q to stop option, but a few of them actually worked. Quite often they would break. The, the program would blow up if you tried Q. So when you write a program, if you're, op if you're offering them the option of bailing out early on data entry, go ahead and um, make sure it works. And the last thing that might be useful is if you let them bail out early on entering the first list of data, if you're comparing two lists of data, remember how many items they entered before they quit so that the second time you go through, you only let them enter that number of items. And also when you start processing it, so you only process that limited number of items. And we talked about that before. That's a partially filled array. If you have room in your array for 119 objects, but they only get up to 100 and then they type Q. Well, if your for loop is going to go all the way down to 119, you know, and it's going to be converting to strings to doubles or whatever, once it gets past 100 and there's all this blank data in your array or null data in your array, the conversions are going to fail and still blow up. So whenever you have a partially filled array, which can happen because you let them uh, queue out of it early, you need to make sure that it's not going to blow up with a null reference because you were trying to process all the way to the end of the array even though the intermediate elements had nulls. Now that wasn't as big of a problem if you made your array an array of ints, you know, because everything got initialized to zero. And so was, you know, we did some comparisons against zero. That didn't cause an error. But if you did an array of strings for your input, then uh, if you bail out early and you had some empty array elements that or null, then when you tried to process those, your program would blow up as well. Okay. That's my mor morality lecture about hard-coded values. If you're dealing with arrays, check the array for the link. Don't just ask. I mean, don't just hard-code it to the maximum value. And I know that if you've programmed in other languages, you probably got used to doing that. You know, either hard-coding the value or setting a constant and using that constant throughout. But it's okay. You know, I didn't count off anybody for that don't think. Come beat me up if I did. Alrighty, I really wanted to get to inheritance and I'm not sure that we're going to do so in the next 20 minutes. Testing objects for equality. We know how to do that. If you use the equal equal sign, then you know that only that they point to the same object. Oh, and by the way, an optimization we can make to dot equals would be to check to see if this is equal to other. Because if they are, 
then there's no reason to continue checking. They're pointing to the same object. If this is equal to other, return true. You could add that to your equals method. And if you did p1 dot equals p1, you know, then lickety split, we bail out of it as soon as possible rather than check all the members. Not necessary, the code would still work, but it's, it's a little bit of an optimization. So we know how to compare two objects. Don't use equal equal. Write a dot equals method. Or at the very least, you have to compare each member uh, separate, separately. Passing references as arguments. Do we know that Java is a pass by copy or a pass by value language? Have we done that? lecture yet. If you pass in a reference to a class, it acts like you've passed in a reference. You can change those values and those changes will stick. And I'll show you what I mean. Up here above main, I'm going to make a function called clear. Public static void clear. And all it does is if you pass in a point, it sets p.x equal to zero, p dot y equal to zero, p dot z is equal to zero. That works. And the reason for that is, is this variable here got a copy of the pointer, the reference of the object being pointed in. And so since they're pointing to the same place in memory, like two streets, signs pointing to the same street, then that's totally good. We can play and change those references and that works. Here's what does not work. If I had written this function like this, I'm going to call this bad clear because it doesn't work. And then if I said point new p is equal to new point, and then I did new or p is equal to new p. Actually, I can make it. Let's let's not even do that. P is equal. To new point. You might think that that would do the same thing. Oh, we're going to make a new point. All the variables are going to be set to zero. All the members are going to be set to zero. But this doesn't work. Why? Because when we get out of bad clear, the value of P will not have been changed. So if I do this, if I do clear P1, that works because the p parameter got an argument that was the address of the object, and so it was allowed to change all of those. That worked just fine. Here, I'm still passing in the address here, but the first thing I do is I turn around and try to reassign that variable to a new address. Well, that's not going to have any effect. It's like doing this. This flat out does not work. Void, you know, foo, int x, x is equal to zero. By the time you call foo down here, any changes you made to it, made to x in here, will not trickle out to here because x only gets a copy of whatever was passed in. And that makes sense because what if you passed in a 7? Are you going to be able to change the value of 7 and somehow 7 miraculously turns into 0 for the rest of the program? No. So since it's a pass by copy language, this flat out does not work. That is why bad clear here also does not work. This does not work because even because although we change the value of the p reference, we are just changing it for the duration of this method. There's an easier way to explain it, but I'm not coming up with it. No, because it's not part of the point class. Okay, if you stick it in the point class, it works. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. That's really the best way to handle it, is to stick all this stuff in the class itself. This works. The second one, clear. This works 
because P gets a copy of the reference the pointer which it can use to change or access the methods, the members. I hope that's clear. That's vaguely subtle, but you know, by when you teach somebody that you can't pass things in by reference in this language, unlike C sharp and C plus plus, then they start thinking that you can't do this at all, or they worry that you know if they make changes to the array, that those changes will not take place. You know, by the time you get by the time you return out of it. But changes to the array do take place. If I was going to write something that would clear out an array, public stat, I'm going to overload it. How about that? And we pass in an array of ints. And then I set each member of that array equal to zero. For every, well, no, I'm not going to use a for each loop. X is equal to zero. X is less than IA dot length x plus plus here's another case where if i had hard coded 10 that would be completely in, inappropriate and i say that i a sub x is equal to zero this is good code it would erase the contents of the array out to the length of it and now i'm going to write a version of bad clear that flat would not work because this is passed by copy not passed by reference so again i'm passing in an integer array and i'm going to say IA is equal to new integer out to the list of the old, out to the length of the original array. There, that ought to wipe it out. It doesn't, though, because we can't change this value, but we can use it for referencing. So, I'm getting an error when I try to, oh, that's because this should have been named bad, clear. That doesn't work either, for the same reason. This does not work because... Although we change the value of the IA reference, we are just changing it for the duration of this method. So by the time we leave this method, nothing will be pointing to this new array and the garbage collector will clean it up. The other one, this does work because IA gets a copy of the reference, the pointer to the array, which it can use to access or change the elements. No, I'm zipping past this because I want to see what the assignment that I had queued up was and to make sure that we have covered the material that would make the assignment possible. You got a question? One of y'all? Uh, the main thing about the passing by value instead of by reference on this is we need to be aware that it's using those memory terms to pass by reference It's not, though, because you're just getting a copy of the reference it's real difficult to get it to duplicate that object on the way in it's still pointing to the same object you're not getting a copy of the object you're just getting a copy of the pointer so it's not ballooning like it does in a language that enforces pure pass by copy where it would duplicate the object on the way in very good question all right, piggy bank, the piggy bank assignment. If any of y'all had me for Java 1, you've probably seen the piggy bank assignment, but this is supposed to be a more, a more better version. Let's take a look. All right, piggy bank assignment. Write a program that simulates a piggy bank. As you know, a piggy bank is a coin bank shame, like, shaped like an animal. The program will prompt the user for how many of what type of coins to add and then tell the user how many coins and the total value in their bank. It should have the following classes, piggy bank, coin, and a client class with a main method. The piggy bank should have an array list of coin objects. The piggy bank will need an add method where you add in number of coins. Now the coin will be a simple class that contains a value. You could create a coin that has a, ma a value of 0.01 for a penny or 0.25 for a quarter or 1 for a dollar. 
then you need to add methods to the piggy bank class to show how many coins are in the bank and how much money is in the bank. And lastly, just to throw a monkey wrench at you, the class should not allow the user to put more than 50 coins in the bank. But hint, implement the whole thing first before you start worrying about putting that limit in it. All right, then to make it easy, I, well, not easy, but to make it simpler, I gave you a UML. So in your piggy bank class, you're going to declare an array list of coin, assuming that you've got a coin class, and you're going to need the following methods. You need get total method, which will return. How do you figure out how much money do you have? You will just iterate through the coin list with a four or four each loop. For each coin in coin list, you know, sum plus equals coin dot value or whatever it is. Get number of coins, all it needs to do is return the length of the coin list. And add coins needs to do a dot add to add a new coin to the coin list. Okay, so that's the UML for piggy bank. And then a UML for the coin class. I say the design of the coin class is left up to you. As long as the piggy bank has the required methods and can return the number of coins and the total value, you will get full credit. But really, all dot coin has to have is a dot is a uh, value member, you know, so that you can track whether that coin is worth point one, you know, for a dime, or point oh five for a nickel, or one point oh for a dollar coin. Extra credit will be given if your program can display a report showing how many coins of each type are in the bank. So here's our sample run. Enter how many coins are zero to quit. Well, I'm going to insert five coins. What type of coin? One for pennies, two for dimes. One. Five pennies were added to the bank. The bank now contains five coins worth zero five dollars. That might be a good thing to add a two-string method for or something. Enter how many coins or zero to quit. Now I'm going to add 40 coins. What type? One for pennies, two for dimes. Okay, two. 40 dimes are added to the bank. I'm not seeing anything in here that, that we hadn't already covered before today, so I'm feeling good about this assignment. It doesn't require, um, you know, inheritance or implementing interfaces or anything like that, but I'm going to give two weeks on it. That doesn't mean that I want you to wait two weeks to do it, but just because we have the final, you know, so let's do that. What I typically have the uh, Java 2 class do is then turn this into a program that does use inheritance and then to make it a GUI application. I'll have to look to see how many weeks left to see if we have time to do all that because there are other things I want to cover too, like multi-threaded applications and GUIs in general. Are you going to go on this one on this part? If we do, it would be very lightly, but I want to. All right, do two weeks. We can't expect you to do the abstract class one unless you already know what abstract classes are or feel like reading about them since we haven't talked about them yet. Okay. What do I want to take you, you to take away out of this? How to write a two-week a, a equals method. How to write a copy method. And how to write a two-string method. And did everybody play along? Did people type this stuff in? If we make it a Dropbox, we have something to upload. If you didn't, say so. If you didn't type along, just upload a note saying, you know, I just watched. And you'll still get credit for it, okay? Because I... I think I did not make it clear at all that this was going to be an in-class assignment, so I'm not going to grade it like one. But I would like for you, I'd like, I would like for everybody here to upload something, even if it's just a text file saying, I watched. Copy equals to string. Class D. All 
All right, gang. Upload something there. Even if it's just a text file that says, I hate you, then if you have any questions over the exam, text or call. Just don't go out to Stack Overflow and post your question there, you know. That's, that's, that's cheating. <laughs> Is there any of y'all who I do not have numbers for, who you, you didn't get a message from me saying it'd be okay to bail on a class if it was storming? Do you want me to have your number? If so. Oh, is that what happened? Okay. Anyway, send me another text saying that you're in this class. You and I are always talking. Why would that be? Could you send me another text? I don't know what happened to your phone number. 898-7767. You already know my number because we talk all the time. Yeah. All right, and we're done.